And good afternoon and hello uh, to the Boston area in Needham, Massachusetts. My name is Evan Weiner. My background is journalism. I was not around in 1948. In fact, I wasn't even a glint in anybody's eye in 1948. Uh, but uh, here we are in 1948. My background is as a journalist, and um, I don't think I really met too many people uh, in my life that, uh, other than those two, because they were my in-laws, uh, who had just gotten married in 1947, and they were looking ahead to a great life ahead of them uh, in 1948 and beyond. But I do have a question uh, about um, 1948. Uh, 1948. Am I talking about 1948? Or am I talking about things that are going on today, like uh, North Korea, run by somebody by the name of Kim, or Israel? This weekend in New York, on May 22nd uh, in New York, uh, I am actually speaking in Manhattan uh, on May 22nd on Sunday at 3 o'clock, and about a mile from where I'm speaking, and I'm giving the same talk uh, on Sunday, will be the Israeli Independence Day Parade. And it will be the uh, 74th anniversary of Israel being uh, independent. But uh, they were attacked the day that they declared their independence. And has anything changed? Uh, Arab-Israeli wars, they're still going on. Uh, oh, USSR against the United States. Well, there's no Soviet Union anymore. But there's still a United States versus Russian mentality out there. Just look at what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, 1948, Czechoslovakia, the Cold War. They decide to go communist in 1948. Oh, the presidential race. Dewey defeats Truman. Um, I don't know if Dewey actually won that, but uh, everybody had written Harry Truman off. And uh, Harry Truman uh, would become uh, reelected or elected for the first time, actually, since he uh, assumed the term of Franklin Roosevelt in 1945 after Roosevelt died in uh, April of 1945. Gandhi was assassinated in India. Oh, the World Health Organization. You hear a lot about the World Health Organization today because of COVID-19. It was founded in 1948. Oh, contempt of Congress. That's an interesting thing because there are some people who uh, have been charged with contempt of Congress. Uh, 1948, a number of people went to jail because of contempt of Congress. Uh, apartheid, that was uh, coming into play in South Africa in 1948. Oh, uh, this old nugget here, uh, the toast of the town starring a columnist and a radio guy by the name of Ed Sullivan, uh, who was kind of wooden, wasn't he? Uh, that starts uh, in 1948, the toast of the town. But let's talk a little bit about North Korea. There's always tension between the United States and North Korea. And North Korea is established in 1948. North Korea had been literally a puppet state of Japan uh, most of the 20th century. In uh, 1910, Japan formally annexed the Korean Peninsula, which it had occupied for about five years following the uh, Russian-Japanese War, which Theodore Roosevelt helped come uh, get the two sides together to come to an agreement. Over the next 35 years, 1910 to 1945, there was colonial rule by Japan. The uh, country did modernize somewhat and industrialize, but uh, many Koreans, and I'm talking about the entire peninsula, North and South Korea, uh, suffered uh, brutal repression at the hands of the Japanese military regime, uh, forcible rapes on women, slavery, other things going on in Korea. That is Kim Il-sung. You know his grandson, because his grandson runs uh, North Korea today. Uh, he was the son of parents who fled to Manchuria during his childhood to escape the Japanese rule of Korea. There is nothing in his background that suggested that he was endowed with certain abilities by God, although now the family, the Kim family, that's the narrative. He attended elementary school in Manchuria, and while a student, he joins a communist youth organization. He was arrested and jailed for his activities with the group in 1929, 1930. China was going through uh, their own internal problems during those years. After his release from prison, he joined the Korean guerrilla resistance, 
against the Japanese occupation sometime during the 1930s. And then he adopts the name of a, a legendary guerrilla fighter against uh, Japan, Kim Il-sung. Um, interesting enough, again, you know, the, the narrative that he comes from a greater place than the rest of us, not necessarily. And there he is as a young man. In the 1930s, he fought against the Japanese occupation of Korea, was singled out by Soviet authorities who sent him to the USSR for military and political training. He became a communist. He fought in the Soviet army during World War II and he got Stalin's attention. And uh, there's a, a picture of North Korea, roughly 1946. Uh, during World War II, Japan sent many Korean men to the front as soldiers or forced them to work in wartime factories, while thousands of young Korean women became comfort women, uh, providing sexual services to Japanese soldiers. Uh, they didn't exactly become comfort women by uh, taking, uh, looking at a newspaper, taking out, uh, looking at an ad, and then going apply for the job. They were kind of forced into it. Following the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that was August 1945, Soviet invasion of Manchuria and the impending overrun of the Korean Peninsula by both U.S. and Soviet forces, Japan surrendered to the Allied forces on August 15, 1945, and that ends 35 years of Japanese colonial rule. Returning to Korea, those of uh, people going back to the peninsula. 1945, the Soviets started to occupy the North, the United States occupies the South. In 1946, Korea's Communist Party, called the Korean Workers' Party, was inaugurated. Soviet-backed leadership installed uh, people, and uh, or Soviet back leadership was installed, and that included the Red Army trained Kim Il sung. The original plan, when it was carved up uh, when they were going through Europe and Asia, was to unify South and North Korea. But uh, North Korea saw itself as the true Korea that stood firm, while the South Koreans capitulated to Japanese and then U.S. power. The people of South. Korea elected the government in May of 1948, creating the Republic of Korea, and the North said, this isn't us, goodbye, farewell, country split on the 38th parallel. On September 9th, the Soviet-backed communists in North Korea created the Democratic People Republic of Korea, or North Korea, and they installed Kim Il-sung as the leader. It would be a communist provisional government until the two Koreas could unite again which has never happened. The uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or North Korea, was established in Pyongyang by the Supreme Leader. Now he is the Supreme Leader. This is where now the, the narrative starts about the Kim family, which continues to this day with the grandson. A communist dictatorship who would uh, tightly control all aspects of citizens' lives. The Republic of Korea, or South Korea, was put claimed its, uh, uh, proclaimed in its capital Seoul uh, under Sigmund Rhee. And there is Sigmund Rhee. So you got this all set up in 1948, the South and the North. And the only thing holding back uh, the North at this point is Joseph Stalin. Sigmund Rhee was a nationalist, Christian. Uh, he formed a Korean exile government during the Japanese occupation. He was elected the president of South Korea. Soviet policies were widely popular with the bulk of the North laborer and peasant population, uh, while the North Koreans, or the, well, that would be North Korea, uh, the middle class would flee to the south of the 38th parallel. The two Koreas are formed. Meanwhile, in 1948, creation of Israel, which in Manhattan will be a, 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 a prayed going from 72nd Street down to 59th Street on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan on Sunday afternoon. And uh, the creation of Israel actually starts November 29th, 1947. For uh, that's when the United Nations uh, voted to allow the creation of a Jewish state. Uh, the Belford Doctrine, uh, back in around 1917, uh, the English tried to do something appease everybody in the Middle East, the, the Jews and the Arabs, 
and they ended up appeasing nobody, absolutely nobody. Uh, and uh, over 30 years of World War II, tensions began to really fester and boiled over. Um, anyway, there was a British mandate for Palestine. Uh, the United Nations uh, proposed in 1947, let's split the area into two, forming an independent Arab state and an independent Jewish state. The Jews said, hey, great, let's take it. We'll take it. This is great. We'll take it. Uh, but the Arabs rejected it. Under the resolution, the uh, area of religious significance surrounding Jerusalem would remain under international control administered by the United Nations. The Palestinian Arabs refused to recognize this arrangement because they thought it was great for the Jews, but unfair to the Arab population who would stay inside uh, the Jewish territory under the partition. By the way, uh, a Bostonian, my old friend, the late Shelley Saltman, who passed away three years ago, who uh, grew up uh, with Barry Morse and uh, Barbara Walters and uh, Leonard Bernstein's mother played Marjan regularly with Shelley's mother, as did David Suskind, and Leonard Nimoy was uh, Shelley's childhood friend, and uh, they all went to the same barber, Leonard Nimoy's barber, Max, up uh, in, near the north end of Boston. But anyway, his cousin, Mutti, uh, was the guy who organized the, uh, in, uh, the uh, Israeli defense uh, force. And Shelley, I know you're listening to me now because your ears are burning. I just know that. And put down the burner phone maybe 15 years from now. We'll, we'll talk about that. But uh, his cousin helped uh, Israel uh, in their freedom movement or in their independence. The creation of Israel. The United States sought a middle way. Still seeking that middle way. By supporting the United Nations resolution, but also encouraging negotiations between Arabs and Jews in the Middle East. Ultimately, Harry Truman gave his uh, stamp of approval to create Israel. So did the Soviet dictator, Joseph Stalin. So they're on the same page with this one. Uh, and there is uh, Harry Truman getting uh, a tour in, uh, as a part of appreciation tour from now the newly created state of Israel as appreciation for his support of the creation. The United Nations resolution sparked conflict between Jewish and Arab groups within Palestine. Fighting began with attacks by irregular bands of Palestinian Arabs attached to local units of the Arab Liberation Army composed of volunteers from Palestine and neighboring Arab countries. Uh, these groups launched their attacks against Jewish cities, settlements, and armed forces. The Jewish forces were composed of the Haganah, the underground militia of the Jewish community in Palestine, and two small irregular groups, the Ergun and the LEH. The goal of the Arabs was initially to block the partition resolution and prevent the establishment of the Jewish state. The Jews, on the other hand, had hoped to gain control of the territory allotted to them under the partition plan. And finally, it's here. In fact, uh, what's today? today is uh, May 16th. So we're going back almost 74 years to the date. The British situation in Palestine deteriorated absolutely deteriorated. There were bombings at the Hotel David uh, in, in, in Israel or in Palestine in those days, and uh, the Brits are looking to get out. Uh, the British situation, uh, they had ruled under a mandate confirmed by the League of Nations in 1922, but it was impossible for them to stay there. They had people on both sides hating them. Uh, so they give up the mandate, announced they were formally withdrawing from Palestine and Israel on midnight, on May 14th. On May 13th, the British High Commissioner, the General, Sir Alan Cunningham, broadcast a farewell message in which he called for moderation by both the Jews and Arabs to preserve the peace. Uh, and there he is. And there really wasn't peace there, so I'm not sure what he was talking about. On May 14th, Cunningham left the government house in Jerusalem after reviewing an honor guard of 50 men of the Highland Light Infantry, those would be the last British troops in the country. He flew to Haifa, where he took the salute from a detachment of the Palestinian police shook hands with both the Jewish mayor of Haifa and the Arab deputy mayor of Haifa. And at midnight, he's safely tucked away on a boat in the Mediterranean, getting away. And he was glad to get away. That is David Ben-Gurion, the first president of Israel, and he is on the cover of Time magazine. 
Four o'clock that afternoon, David Ben-Gurion announced the formation of the State of Israel, the first independent Jewish state in 19 centuries of history by reading out a proclamation. And this is what it was. By virtue of the natural and historic right of the Jewish people and by resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, we hereby proclaim the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine to be called Israel. Well, if the Arabs had their way, that country would have lasted one day because the war is on. Five Arab armies from Egypt, Transjordan, which is now Jordan, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon invaded the new state that night looking to destroy the new country. But Israel was armed. They had arms from Czechoslovakia and from France. They were well prepared for what the onslaught that they were getting. Uh, the Arab-Israeli War of 1948, uh, the stated purpose by the Arabs of the invasion was to restore the law and order in light of British withdrawal. The Israelis, meanwhile, won control of the main road to Jerusalem through the Yehuda Mountains, the hills of Judea, and successfully repulsed repeated Arab attacks. At the end of the war, Egypt had gained control of the Gaza Strip. Jordan annexed the West Bank. And here we are, all these years later, still talking about the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Think of this. It's nearly three quarters of a century. And the problems that happened three quarters of a century ago remain today. Israel prevailed in what came to be known as its War of Independence, but the war bore a heavy cost. One percent of uh, Israel's total population died in the war. In the Arab world, the war came to be known as the Nekba, or the catastrophe, because of the large number of refugees and displaced persons resulting from the war. The War of 1948, 700,000 Palestinian Arabs fled or left after being caught up in the fight. The large numbers who stayed in Israel, though, became full citizens with equal rights. The others, well, to this day, perpetual refugee status in Arab states. 800,000 Jews were expelled from Arab countries, but um, they went to Israel. They had a new home, and they went about building a new home. Meanwhile, not too far away in Europe, the Cold War. The Berlin blockade. Stalin decides he's got to uh, block Berlin and the United States and the Allies. And remember, Stalin and the United States were on the same side during World War II, and that was only three years earlier, but things had fallen apart. There was a lack of consensus with the Soviet on the future, with Soviets on the future of Germany, uh, led by the uh, United States, uh, Great Britain, and France uh, to support. And what they were basically doing, they had their own occupation zones, and that's what they were going to take care of, their own occupation zones. And you couldn't get them to meld into a single independent state. Um, in December of 1946, they tried to do so. Uh, but the Soviets did not wish the Western zones and country to unify under a democratic pro-capitalist government. Uh, and the Soviets and Stalin also feared the possibility of a unified Berlin, or West Berlin, located within the entire Soviet sector, which would become known as East Berlin. Three days after the uh, Western allies uh, authorized the introduction of a new currency in the West, uh, West Germany, the Deutschmark, Stalin uh, ordered uh, all of the land and uh, Western zones of the city of Berlin to be cut off, hoping to starve the western parts of the city into submission. That would be in June 1948. The Berlin blockade was also a test of the emerging U.S. emerging U.S. policy of containment. And uh, there is the airlift bringing supplies into West Berlin. Unwilling to abandon Berlin, the United States, Great Britain, and France began to deliver all needed supplies to West Berlin by air. There's also the Marshall Plan that was going on at that time. That was basically to rebuild uh, as much as Europe as the West had. Uh, it was also known as the European Recovery Program, a United States program providing aid to Western Europe following the devastation of World War II. Uh, enacted in 1948, it would be $15 million, billion, $15 billion 
about $165 billion today to help finance uh, rebuilding efforts on the continent. Uh, the U.S. Secretary of State was George C. Marshall, and he had a four-year plan to reconstruct cities, industries, infrastructure, uh, heavily damaged during the war, and to remove trade barriers between European neighbors, uh, as well as foster uh, commerce between those countries and the United States. Remember, the United States is flying high at this point. No competition for United States steel, no competition really for United States products. On uh, February, April the 3rd, 1948, Harry Truman signed the Marshall Plan into law. Aid was distributed to 16 European nations, including Berlin. And there was a lot of damage in Berlin because of the uh, Blitzkrieg. Uh, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, West Germany, and Norway. Uh, you win some, you lose some. This was a big loss. Uh, Czechoslovakia goes communist, and it was a big loss for the West. On February 25th, under pressure from the Czechoslovakian Communist Party, the president, Edward Benes, uh, allows a communist dominated, uh, organized, uh, dominated government to be organized. The Soviet Union uh, would not be involved in this one. They would be 20 years later. Um, Western observers uh, looked at this and said, hey, wait, what's going on here? This is a bloodless coup, and they're getting away with it. And this is an example of Soviet expansion into Eastern Europe. Uh, there were rigged elections held in May to validate the communist victory. Ben has resigned. His former uh, foreign minister, Yad Mazarek, died under very suspicious circumstances. Uh, that would happen to uh, Dubček, who led the uh, uh, Prague Spring in 1968, he would eventually die under very suspicious uh, circumstances many years later, two decades later. The United States and Great Britain uh, denounced the communist seizure of power in Czechoslovakia, but neither took any direct action. Uh, there was a love affair that split up, though, between Yugoslavia and the USSR, Tito and Stalin. Um, never did get back together. Uh, on June 28th, the Communist Information Bureau, a movement that brought together all the European communists and socialist states at the time, passed a resolution against the League of Communists of uh, Yugoslavia, citing the presence of national elements in Yugoslavia and expelling it from the bloc. The split between the Yugoslavian president, Josip Broz Tito, and the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, harmed the relations between Yugoslavia and the USSR. Truman versus Dewey actually passed uh, Tom, Thomas Dewey's house a couple of years ago. It's still still up there uh, in uh, mid Hudson uh, Valley, New York, by Pauling, New York. He didn't live very far from uh, Edward R. Morrow or Lowell Thompson or uh, Sally Jesse Raphael, whose uh, structure is up there. It looks like a haunted house when you pass it, but she's up there as well. Um, 1948 presidential election. Harry Truman has some perceived problems. Actually, they were very real problems. The Democrats had a very poor showing in the 1946 midterm congressional elections. The Republicans took over the uh, control of the House and the uh, Senate for the first time since 1928. Remember that House and Senate uh, didn't live through the Depression because the Depression hit in October 1929. And uh, the pundits, the know-it-all pundits of those days, eh, Truman, nah, no way he's going to win. Absolutely no way he's going to win. It's going to be Dewey. You know, Dewey did pretty well in 1944. This time he's going to win. Public a poll, take a public opinion poll taken in December 1947 revealed that only 35% uh, of those uh, supported Truman's handling of the presidency. In 1947, Truman worked hard to build support uh, for his candidacy among the key segments of the Democratic Party. But uh, 1946 was a, a year that uh, labor lost. Uh, Ralph Kiner, the New York Mets announcer, uh, we were talking one day, and of all people, Ralph Kiner, the New York Mets announcer, and the great home run hitter in the uh, National League in the 1940s and 50s, of all people, he and I were talking about labor uh, in the 1940s, but there was a reason because uh, Ralph was a player representative and he was part of that 1946 uh, Pittsburgh Pirate team that almost went on strike. Um, it came close, but Rip Sewell and a couple others decided that 
they weren't going to strike for better, what was literally better benefits, not even salary. But there were a lot of strikes uh, around the United States in 1946. Uh, guys came back, they put their lives on the line, and they told their employers, hey, we put our lives on the line to defend democracy, and by the way, your companies pay us. Well, um, 1946, uh, the Senate, both the Republicans and some Democrats didn't like the fact that labor was becoming more organized and also that they were they thought that uh, labor was having too much power. So they came up with this thing, Taft-Hartley, Taft-Hartley bill that uh, was passed in uh, 1947. Um, and Truman vetoed it. Uh, he also courted black Americans coming out in favor of civil rights and he embraced uh, programs like national health insurance, a higher minimum wage, uh, federal housing measure, which was all dear to party liberals. And uh, some of that's still being talked about nearly three quarters of a century later. Truman's anti-Soviet foreign policy won him uh, support among Americans with roots in Eastern Europe and among anti-communist liberals. Presidential election, there's Harry Truman. In May, he recognized the new state of Israel and that solidified his relationship with American Jews. And Truman uh, wasn't uptight anymore. Uh, he became, became kind of like an uncle or a grandfather. He was more relaxed, uh, folksy, and sometimes, uh, though on, on the campaign trail, sometimes he'd give them hell, Harry, uh, with fiery speaking, uh, fiery speaking technique. So he combines both style and substance, substance in launching effective campaigns against the Republicans. But uh, midway through 1948, Truman's popularity among American voters is still languishing. Uh, Dewey, our next president, uh, does he look like the does he look like the groom standing there with the bride on a wedding cake? Yes or no? Some people thought he did. 1948, the Republicans nominated uh, the governor, Thomas E. Dewey, whose throughway is one and a half miles from where I'm sitting right now, uh, that they named the throughway after him, for president and the California governor, Earl Warren, for vice president. Dewey had run in 1948 against FDR, lost a close race. He remained young, although he's four years older, and he was popular and he was somewhat progressive. He was strongly anti-communist. He was an internationalist in foreign affairs. He wasn't too thrilled with FDR's uh, New Deal. He was a critic of the New Deal, but uh, he didn't exactly say why he was a critic other than he didn't like what came out of it, uh, Social Security. But um, Social Security was popular. So maybe he didn't like the mechanism because he actually was in favor of Social Security. On uh, February 2nd, Truman asked Congress to support the civil rights package that included federal protection against lynching. Federal protection against lynching. Let that sink in for a minute. Better protection of the right to vote and a permanent Fair Employment Practices Committee. But the speech was not well received by Congress and certain Democrats in the South. The Dixiecrats, Strom Thurmond. I gave this talk uh, last week on uh, Thursday afternoon, and there's a picture of me, it's Columbia, South Carolina, and on top of me, Strom Thurmond, because I knew one day I was going to give a talk involving Strom Thurmond. But anyway, this woman started applauding. I said, why are you applauding? You applauding Strom Thurmond? She said, no, you for standing underneath him without vomiting. <laughs> I said, okay, all right. Uh, Truman faced the prospect of losing the votes of conservative southern wing of the, Dem the uh, Democratic Party, which threatened to bolt over the president's public embrace of African-American civil rights. Remember, Jackie Robinson just broke into Major League Baseball the year before. The NFL desegregated two years earlier, and Irene Morgan uh, won her Supreme Court case, which allowed her and other African-Americans to sit on a bus and not have to get up. Um, that was in 1946, uh, although that wasn't enforced. It was the Dixiecrats. The Dixiecrats also called themselves the state's rights Democratic Party. Uh, they were members of a right-wing Democratic splinter group organized by Southerners who objected to the civil rights program of the Democratic Party. 
At the Democratic Convention in July, Truman's approach uh, collapsed after pro-civil rights Democrats and anti-communist liberals from the organization American for Democratic Action won a strong civil rights plank for the party's platform. And these guys walked out. They were from Mississippi and North Carolina and from Arkansas and from Virginia and from Kentucky. Um, they walked out. They couldn't deal with the fact that in Arkansas, they couldn't deal with the fact that um, Truman was actually supporting civil rights. The Dixiecrats would meet in Birmingham, Alabama, and on July 17th, nominated South Carolina Governor Strong Strom Thurmond for president and Governor Fielding L. Wright of Mississippi for vice president. Uh, I'm not sure if Strom Thurmond had his African American mistress and his African-American kids by this point, but that would eventually come out. And yet here he is uh, leading the way against civil rights uh, legislation. The Dixiecrats opposed federal regulations that they considered to interfere with states' rights. The Dixiecrats were disgusted with the National Democratic Platform for embracing a platform to eliminate the poll tax, want to get rid of the poll tax, and pass fair labor practices and anti-lynching laws. This is Executive Order 9981. Harry Truman desegregates the American military. On July 26, Truman signs that executive order calling for the desegregation of the U.S. Armed Forces. Now, let's nuance this just a little bit. During the Battle of the Bulge in 1944, uh, Dwight Eisenhower was running out of troops. So he called in uh, uh, black, uh, black units. Uh, some of the fighters went to the front line and they volunteered from the front line. So that is really when uh, the beginning of uh, the desegregation begins with Dwight Eisenhower because he needs troops. Since the American Revolution, African Americans had served in the military but almost always separated from white soldiers and usually in menial roles. That is the ambassador to Libya wasn't quite the ambassador of Libya in 1948, Edward R. Dudley. Uh, he was a civil rights lawyer in the 1940s. He was appointed to the New York Attorney's General Attorney General's Office. He was recruited by Thurgood Marshall to become a special assistant with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Truman sends Dudley to Liberia as U.S. envoy and minister Upon the elevation of the mission in Libya to a full U.S. Embassy in 1949, Dudley was promoted to the rank of ambassador. With that, Ambassador Dudley became the first black ambassador in U.S. history. Libya was one of five places the State Department deemed appropriate for black diplomats. Well, Truman has problems with uh, progressives, and he has problems with Henry Wallace. And if you look at some of the... Uh, uh, posters there, they include end lynching, Winwood Wallace, veterans want housing, not states' rights, Wallace 48, humans rights, human rights, not states' rights, Wallace in 48, states' rights, Democrats, counter uh, demonstration behind these people. In January, Truman's former Secretary of Commerce and the Vice President during uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's third time, Henry Wallace, announced that he was going to run for president as a member of the Progressive Party. In September 1946, Secretary Wallace had delivered a speech critical of the administration's increasingly hardline foreign policy towards the Soviet Union. Truman asked for Wallace's resignation. Wallace quits. He's a third party candidate now. Many years he had been the darling of the left wing of the Democratic Party, and he threatened to rob Truman of the progressive vote. Win with Wallace, Henry Wallace. The Progressive Party was founded in 1947. In 1948, he campaigned on changes in foreign policy, uh, particularly advocated a more conciliatory policy toward the Soviet Union. Uh, the party warned that American life was in danger. The root cause of the crisis, he argued, party argued, big business is big business in control of our economy and government. The final campaign, and there is Thomas Dewey. I don't know, did he look like uh, the guy on top of a wedding cake? Truman seemed to have a slim chance of retaining the White House. After all, he was never elected. 
Viewers uh, viewed him as an ineffectual shadow of his four-time predecessor, four-term predecessor, uh, Roosevelt, who really didn't serve four terms. He served three full terms and then a couple months of another term. But his first term started in March of 1933. So really only uh, uh, he was there for only uh, three terms, three full terms in one month. He also antagonized Southern Democrats with his civil rights initiative. So he hits the campaign trail hard after Labor Day, using a presidential train to crisscross the country, makes more than 200 campaign speeches. Dewey's dull. He's a dull speaker, and he figures this is all wrapped up. He's got in the bag, so why go out there and campaign? You don't have to do it. The pollsters stopped polling before the effect of Truman's whistle-stop campaigning took hold. So that was October. They didn't know really, or the pulse, well, we don't even know if the pollsters know what's going on today. So they didn't know what was going on in 1948. And there he is. Give him hell, Harry. He's going from city to city on the back of that train on the whistle stop campaign, giving his speeches, the fiery speeches, the folksy Harry Truman and all. Give him hell. The Democrat revolt, Democratic revolts work to Truman's advantage. The Dixiecrat party breakoff assured black voters of Truman's commitment to civil rights, which he reinforced in 1948 with the executive orders, desegregating the armed forces and ending bias in federal employment practices. Wallace's progressive party was supported by the Communist Party of the United States, which is a problem because people are looking for communists everywhere. So that made it difficult for anyone to label Truman as soft on communism. Uh, for his part, Truman relentlessly accused the do-nothing Republican Congress of failing to meet the needs of the American people, a tirade that served him well with the common voter. He travels 31,000 train miles across the country, 352 speeches, and personalized them. He reached 3 million people. He stopped in Harlem the first time the uh, U.S. president had ever visited the symbolic capital of Black America. Yeah, the home of the Apollo and uh, also the Cotton Club. Uh, although Atlanta might have uh, basically uh, argued that as well, uh, the home of Martin Luther King and, and, they, and the middle class in Atlanta. But Thomas Dewey, he's the man the polls projected would win or the pollsters projected would to win. He ended up losing. Truman defeats Dewey, the Chicago Tribune. Well, those days, the Chicago Daily Tribune. I worked for the Tribune Company back uh, about 15 years ago doing op-ed pieces for New York Newsday, the Orlando Sentinel, uh, OI, their Spanish paper uh, as well. Um, and uh, there he is, uh, Truman defeats Dewey uh, and the Baltimore Sun. Uh, why did Dewey lose? Well, he's a poor candidate. He was stiff. He was uh, aloof. He was self-confident to the point of complacency. Truman didn't go out there like Truman did. Dewey didn't go out there like Truman did. Uh, the Ethel, uh, the actress Ethel Barrymore, maybe stealing Alice Roosevelt's line, probably did. Uh, she said of Dewey, Dewey looks like the bridegroom on the wedding cake. Now you tell me, does he look like the bridegroom on the wedding cake there? Well, I don't know. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. On election day, Truman kept just enough of the traditional South, the Democratic South, all but four states in the Farm Belt, as well as the Far West uh, in the Electoral College uh, for the Democrats. Dewey carried almost all of the Northeast, which today is unheard of by a Republican, as well as his native Michigan, Indiana, and added four Great Plains states. Wallace won about 2% of the popular vote. He didn't get any electoral votes, so it uh, didn't matter. But Strom Thurmond did. He got 39 electoral votes, winning four southern states. Gandhi is assassinated in um, 1948, and uh, this is after India and Pakistan now uh, become countries. On January 30th, uh, Gandhi, the uh, political and spiritual leader of the Indian independence movement, is assassinated in New Delhi by a Hindu extremist. Uh, Gandhi had been a political activist and was arrested numerous times for his role in pushing for India's independence. With the outbreak of World War II, Gandhi returned to politics and called for Indian cooperation with the British war effort in exchange 
for independence. Uh, but he leads the Quit India movement. Um, Britain refused and sought to, to divide India by supporting conservative Hindu and Muslim groups. If you go through British history, they conquer and divide, conquer and divide. They did so in the Middle East uh, with uh, the Arabs and, uh, and the Israelis. They did so throughout uh, uh, the uh, African countries. In fact, the only countries they really didn't conquer and divide were the uh, United States, Canada, and Australia. Those are the only three. Uh, in response, Gandhi launched the Quit India movement in 1942, which called for total British uh, withdrawal. Gandhi and other national leaders were imprisoned until 1944. 1945, a new government, uh, Clement Attlee, came to power in Britain. Uh, they had enough of Winston Churchill, even though he led them through the war in Europe, uh, but they bounced him uh, for Attlee, and negotiations for India's independence began. Gandhi saw the unify in India, but the Muslim League, which had grown in influence during the war, disagreed. Um, and it became Pakistan and India. Gandhi is assassinated. After uh, protracted talks, Britain agreed to create two new independent states of India and Pakistan, August 15, 1947. He was greatly distressed by the partition. He wanted one country, and bloody violence soon broke out between Hindus and Muslims in India. In an effort to end India's religious strife, he uh, resorted to fasts and visits to troubled areas. On one such uh, vigil in New Delhi, uh, uh, he meets up with uh, Nathurtham Gutsi, a Hindu extremist who objected to Gandhi's tolerance for uh, Muslims and um, he fatally shoots him. Uh, and there is uh, Gutsi, who is uh, standing trial. Gandhi is uh, referred to as the father of the nation, he said, but if that's so, he has failed in his parental duty inasmuch as he has acted very treasonously to the nation by his consenting to partition of it. His inner voice, his spiritual power, his doctrine of nonviolence, of which so much is made of, proved to be powerless. Meanwhile, Tojo is killed, uh, executed in Japan. The International Military Tribunals for the Far East. The International Military Tribunals for the Far East comes to an end on November 4th. The trial ended with 25 of 28 Japanese defendants being found guilty. Of the other three defendants, uh, two had died during the lengthy trial and one was declared insane. By the way, the Nuremberg trials, about a dozen people from Germany uh, were convicted. Uh, on November 12th, the War Crimes Tribunal passed death sentences on seven of the men, including General Hideki Tojo, who served as the Japanese prime uh, premier during the war. Uh, Tojo was executed by hanging on December 23rd. The World Health Organization is established. You hear about them a lot because of COVID-19. Also, smallpox, uh, uh, when smallpox uh, was ended. Uh, which goes back over 40 years, eradicated. Uh, the World Health Organization, also known as WHO, was established on April 7th. The day that was founded became a worldwide day of awareness known as World Health Day. The organization is an agency of the United Nations with the primary objective of reaching health, of researching health issues, eradicating disease, and promoting healthy practices worldwide. Red Scare. Truman is tough on communists. The Red Scare in Hollywood. Uh, America is going through a period where uh, the new enemy is communism. And uh, America is looking under every uh, nook in every nook and cranny and under every rock for a communist. July 1946. Billy Wilkerson, the Hollywood reporter, a trade magazine for the film, TV, radio industry. Hollywood reporter, owner, editor, and publisher started to expose communists while working or working in Hollywood. He would name the alleged Reds in his trade views column and expose this lurking menace. On July 29, 1946, uh, Wilkerson published a trade views column that included the names of uh, Dalton Trumbo, Howard Koch, and nine other Hollywood players the editor branded as communist sympathizers. He ruined lives. He also had nothing to back him up. He got away with it. Well, why, why was uh, Wilkerson, did he have an axe to grind? Apparently he did. 
he was a failed actor and he had some jealousy. But uh, looking for communists in Hollywood had gone back to the 1930s. In fact, this guy, Walt Disney, with uh, his uh, creation, Steamboat Willie slash Mickey Mouse, went hunting for communists. Uh, he branded some of his former animators as communists. Um, he said the Screen Actors Guild was a communist front uh, and labeled the 1941 strike that hit his studio as a communist plot. He even contacted the FBI about alleged communist infiltration at the studio. Mr. Reagan goes to Washington. The first trip that he ever made to Washington was in 1947, October 20th. Members of the House on Un-American of uh, the House on Un-American Activities Committee began an investigation into alleged communist influences in the film industry. Lauren Bacall, Humphrey Bogart, um, Gene Kelly, and uh, John Huston signed a petition denouncing uh, the Committee is on American itself for probing the politics of individual citizens. Reagan testified that a small clique of communists have attempted to be a disruptive influence within the Screen Actors Guild, of which he was president. And these are the Hollywood Ten, and they've been in trouble for a while. Initially, it was 11. One guy uh, turned evidence against the other guys. In November 1947, 10 screenwriters and directors refused to testify, arguing that the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution guaranteed the freedom to belong to any political organization they chose. The 10, Alva Besson, Herbert Bieberman, Lester Cole, Edward Dimitrik, Ring Lardner Jr., I know his son Rex Lardner and his other son Michael Lardner, Rex is fine, he lives out in Chicago now, John Howard Lawson, Albert Maltz, Samuel Ornitz, Adrian Scott, and Dalton Trumbo. See, but Congress didn't see it that way. They didn't see it that way at all. Uh, and a month later, they were cited in contempt. And they ended up on trial. The Justice Department put them on trial because if you are, are cited for contempt of uh, Congress, that's what the Justice Department does. They put you on trial. Each of the men were found guilty, sentenced to spend one year in prison and pay a $1,000 fine, which now would be something like an $11,000 fine. Meanwhile, apartheid starts to take hold in South Africa. Caution, beware of the natives, two natives. After the National Party gained power in South Africa in 1948 with its all-white government immediately, uh, its all-white government immediately uh, began enforcing existing policies of racial segregation. Under apartheid, non-white South African, the majority of the population would be forced to live in separate areas from whites and use separate public facilities. Contact between the two groups would be limited. Toast to the town. How many of you watched... Uh, On our very stage tonight, how many of you watched uh, the Ed Sullivan show? Uh, Ed Sullivan from about 10 miles north of here in Port Chester, New York. There is an Ed Sullivan street up there. I need to take a picture of that and put it in my presentations. Anyway, the toast of the town starts, the Ed Sullivan show. Uh, he was a newspaper reporter. He covered sports for a variety of New York papers until 1931 and then gets out of sports and starts writing feature stuff about uh, Broadway. And the New York Daily News decides to hire him to do a regular column called Little Old New York. And he's talking about all aspects of the city. Ed's 30 years old by this point. Uh, beginning in the late 1920s, somebody in his 20s, he began hosting radio programs with Broadway themes. Uh, Jimmy Durante, Irving Berlin, Jack Benny made their radio debuts on his show. So he's doing his show on radio 40 years, 20 years before he even starts on TV. The Toast of the Town. By the 1940s, while hosting Ed Sullivan pre Presents from the 21 Club, Barbara Walters' uh, father, Lou, at one point in his life was uh, the uh, maitre d', a maitre d' at the 21 Club, which is now out of business. And began to accept offers to MC reviews at theaters in Manhattan, which led him to hosting additional events. CBS would hire Ed Sullivan to host its first variety show, Endeavor, a new format that combined vaudeville with television. It was nicknamed Vaudio. Uh, the show was called Toast of the Town. Ed Sullivan was a man who couldn't sing, couldn't dance, 
spin plates. Oh, when I was a kid, I used to watch Sullivan Show, watch those plate spinners. Uh, I, I used to love plate spinners. They still do some plate spinning on cruise ships, by the way, the jugglers do. You get that, that little uh, pull cue up there. Then, oh, nothing, nothing better than a really good plate spinner. Just nothing better at all. But Ed was pasty in his bright lights, shifty in his stances, bungled the introductions in the monologues. I'll give you a story from my cousin, Jerry Stiller. Stiller and Mirror, my cousin, Jerry Stiller. Ben Stiller is my cousin. Amy Stiller is my cousin. And I guess Ann is related through uh, marriage uh, to me. And uh, Jerry's telling me the story one day about Anna Marie Albergetti and uh, Stiller and Mirror on the show. And Ed had something for everybody. He had something, Topio Gigio for the six year olds. He had something for the teenagers, you know, Herman Termits, Beatles. Had something for the twenty-somethings um, comedians. He had something for the uh, uh, parents with teenagers, the empty nesters, and Durante for the uh, people, the senior citizens. He, seg he, he segmented the audiences, which is now done, but he did it first. Anyway, uh, so he's uh, Jerry's telling me a story about Anna Marie Albergetti, who, by the way, was uh, in a summer stock production with my wife. I think it was Kismet, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, uh, so uh, she's on Broadway and uh, on Sunday nights, Broadway is dark. So Ed's able to get a singer from Broadway to do something from the uh, whatever show that they're in. So Anna Marie Albergetti is there and she's uh, doing uh, whatever show she's in, doing a song for or two from the show. And she's done with her set. And uh, well, she goes out to say hello to Ed, and Ed's, uh, you know, she's waiting for a plus. A plus is coming. The audience didn't like it all that much. And Ed starts cheering on the audience. Come on, come on, come on, come on, let's hear it. Come on, let's hear it, let's hear it, let's hear it. Let's hear it for Ava Maria. Let's hear it for Ava Maria. The noted radio comedian, Fred Allen, who had a face made for radio, said of Ed Sullivan, Ed Sullivan will be around as long as someone else has talent. Fred was right. Oh, on the first show, Martin and Lewis, uh, at the height of their career, uh, Jerry and Dean. Uh, also, Rodgers and Hammerstein were on. There was a pianist. There was a ballerina. There was a troop of crewing firemen from somewhere in the New York area. And a boxing referee whose next gig was the uh, Joe Lewis, Jersey Joe Walcott match. He had a little something for everybody for 23 years. The critics were rough on Ed. They lambasted him for his wooden hosting style. Hey, you know, that was Ed. That was Ed. But the show did well anyway. Uh, he had to look at his watch because he had to get the commercials on. That's when he did that. He looked at his watch. That's what Jerry told me. But the show did well anyway. That's my friend, the late Bob Block. It's me, Frank Carney. Frank Carney was uh, involved in the early days of cable TV. And Bob Block invented pay TV, uh, the Womeco Home Service. And this is 10 years ago. He just passed away. Uh, Bob was a lot of things in his career. He was a marketing guy in uh, Milwaukee for uh, Selig Ford. Ford uh, and knew Bud Selig, Bud Selig rather, Selig Ford. Uh, he knew Bud Selig as uh, somebody he went to uh, college with, uh, and he ended up uh, doing um, advertising uh, for Selig Ford. He also went to school with the Senator Herbert Cole, handled uh, a small uh, supermarket uh, chain called Coles. And you know what that is today. He also owned a comedy club. And uh, he employed people like Henny Youngman and Maury Amsterdam, never employed Milton Berle because he wore blue and he didn't want any dirty jokes. Uh, keep Bob in mind for a second. There were 44,000 television sets in the United States in use in 1947. There were 2 million sets uh, in American homes in 1948, of which uh, 720,000 were in the New York area or 36%. Henny Youngman is contacted by his agent about the show that's jumping from radio to TV, but would coincide, and Henny was English, born in Liverpool, but would coincide with a scheduled performance before Princess Elizabeth in London. And I'm going to ask you a question. If you had a chance to be on early TV or do a royal performance, what would you do? You can put the answer in uh, the, the, um, in the little box there. Uh, 1948 also, uh, the FCC put a freeze on awarding new television station licenses because 
the fast pace of licensing prior to 1948 had created some conflicts with signals across the country, like, you know, channel four, five, six, and seven. There were some uh, conflicts with all that. There were 30 stations operating in 19 cities, uh, just four cities, including Los Angeles, uh, west of the Mississippi had TV stations. There were four networks, ABC, CBS, Dumont, and, uh, and uh, NBC. There were no stations in Canada. Oh, getting back to Henny Youngman standing there before in front of the Brooklyn Bridge. I have a picture just like that, too. Uh, take my wife, please. Well, Bob Block said that Henny Youngman died a bitter man. Why was he a bitter man? Well, his agent said, well, I'm not going to press you into this. Uh, you could do the TV gig or you could do the uh, gig before uh, Princess Elizabeth and the royal family. It's up to you. You know, you're the one who has to decide. I don't want to put any pressure on you. Uh, but this TV thing, nobody knows much about. And you know, that's a sure thing in England. But we'll leave it up to you. Uh, Henny Youngman, according to Bob Block, died a bitter man. Should have been Mr. Television, but he turned down the chance to try out for a radio show that moved to TV. Yeah, choice. Perform at the Royal Show? Take a chance on an unknown medium called TV. He took the London gig. Who you can trust your car to, the man who wears the star, the big, bright, red Texaco star. Texaco is out of business in the United States, but it's still the name is used in places like Colombia, South America. On June 8, 1948, four singing Texaco servicemen introduce Milton Berle as the first TV host of the Texaco Star Theater. Program began as a 1932 radio show with Fred Allen as the host and became television's first hit show. Burrow was originally supposed to alternate with several other hosts, including Henny Youngman. But he drew so much fan mail that NBC gave him the spot exclusively. And there he is, uh, not in drag in this one, but there he is, uh, the Texaco Star Theater from 1948. The show dominated all television competition. 90% of America's sets tuned to Uncle Milty on Tuesday nights. When the show went on the air, movie theaters across the U.S. would go dark and shop owners would put up signs announcing close tonight to watch Milton Berle. Now, there I am. This, this picture is about 15 years old. If you're in the New York area, you might have listened to that woman, Shelley Strickler. Uh, she was on WOR radio as a reporter, and I met her back in 1979, 1980. We were covering a, a story in West Nyack, New York, about uh, contaminated well water that was going into houses for years and years. The man to the left uh, on the picture, the right of me, is Larry Strickler. He was on the, uh, the, the show, the Texaco Star Theater, as a uh, childhood star, eight-year-old. Uh, he gives talks, they live in Florida now, about Milton Berle, about the early days of TV. He was on the Howdy Doody show as well. He ended up becoming a high school guidance counselor in Brooklyn, New York. Larry Strickler, child actor on the show, he said that uh, Berle was a perfectionist. That's why the show worked. He said Milton knew, he said he met Milton about 40 years after the show, and he still had a kinescope, and they watched the show together, and Milton said, stop it, I want to tell you what's going to happen. And Burl remembered everything that was going to happen on the show, because he knew what he wanted to do. He's a perfectionist. Henny Youngman, uh, according to Larry, couldn't do what uh, Burl did. Burl could do a little acting. Henny was great as a, just a, a, a machine gun jokester. He would tell joke after joke after joke after joke. He was great. Take my wife, please. And then there'd be 75 more jokes right after that. Really fast, rapid fire. Burl could do a lot of things. Uh, Henny never would have had the success. And Larry was on the show. What he would know that Burl did. Gentlemen's Agreement. Donald Zanuck. Starring, uh, presents, uh, starring uh, Gregory Peck, Dorothy McGuire, John Garfield, also Julius uh, Garfinkel was his name, Gentleman's Agreement. And this movie might have killed John Garfield. Uh, Gentleman's Agreement, a journalist by the name of Phil Green in the movie, Gregory Peck moves to New York City, takes on a high-profile magazine assignment about anti-Semitism. Uh, in order to truly view things from an 
uh, emphatic perspective. He pretends to be a Jew and begins to experience many forms of bigotry in the city, New York City, and in the Connecticut suburbs, uh, Darien. Uh, both firsthand and through a Jewish friend by the name of Dave Goldman, played by John Garfield or Julius Garfinkel. Oh, welcome to Darien, Connecticut. If you take uh, 95 going north, if you're going from New York City to Boston on 95, uh, around exit uh, 8, exit 9 uh, in Connecticut, uh, there is the service station Darien, Connecticut. Darien, Connecticut, north. It was released Gentlemen's Agreement on November 11th, 1947 in New York. 1948, it was nominated for eight Oscars and won three. Best Picture, Best Supporting Actress, uh, Celeste Holm, Best uh, Director, uh, Ilya Kazan. The movie was an unexpected hit at the box office. According to Variety, it earned nearly $4 million in rentals in 1948 in the U.S., which would be roughly around, uh, multiply it by about 13, and you get about $52 million. House on Un-American Activities. They were very, very interested in this movie for some reason. Extremely interested in this movie. Uh, it was political and it upset the House on Un-American Activities Committee. And Ily Kazan, Daryl Zanuck, John Garfield, Julius uh, Garfinkel, and Anne Revere. I don't know if she was uh, related to Paul, being your neck of the words, all being called to testify before the committee. Uh, Re uh, Revere refused to testify. Although Garfield appear, uh, appeared, he refused to name names because uh, they were after his wife. Uh, both were placed in the red channels of the Hollywood blacklist. Garfield remained on the blacklist for a year, was called again to testify against his wife, Roberta, and he dies of a heart attack uh, before the second hearing date. Uh, see, uh, his wife, Roberta Garfield, and that's who they were after, was briefly a member of the Communist Party, and they were going to do what they could to destroy Julius Garfinkel, uh, John Garfield's career. Uh, that picture was taken by a guy by the name of Nat Fine, who I met when I was about 23 years old. I was at uh, WGRC Radio. That was in Nanuet, New York, about 23 miles north of Manhattan. And uh, Nat Fine had a little photography agency uh, or office or, or place in Piermont, New York. And um, Nat Fine uh, was a uh, major, major, major photographer in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, he worked for the uh, one of the papers that folded in the 1960s and uh, never got another job, despite the fact he won a Pulitzer Prize for this picture, uh, the last time Babe Ruth is standing uh, at Yankee Stadium at attention for the national anthem, uh, the spindly legs, uh, the, still the big upper torso of a dying Babe Ruth. On uh, August 16th, Babe Ruth dies from cancer, New York City. He hit a record 60 home runs in 1927, led the Yankees to seven pennants, retired as a member of the Boston Braves. Uh, in 1935, he hit his last three home runs of his 714 career home runs in one game against Pittsburgh as a member of the Braves. The Globetrotters, the Harlem Globetrotters, and uh, they were a great basketball team. Hey, they were bigger than, in those days, the BAA, the Basketball Association of America, the National Basketball League. Um, they were huge. Their brand was huge. And there was Abe Saperstein who uh, ran them. Abe Saperstein's Harlem Globetrotters, bigger than any of the pro basketball leagues at that point. 1940, the Globetrotters won professional ba the Professional Basketball Tournament Championship. Uh, the Globetrotters brand, well-known and marketable. On February 19th, Saperstein's Harlem Globetrotters took on the National Basketball League's Minneapolis Lakers in the first game of a doubleheader at Chicago Stadium. The Basketball Association of America's New York Knicks and Chicago Stags played what was thought to be the main game, but it really wasn't because 17,823 fans came out to see the Globies and the Lakers. The Lakers led by George Mikan at that point, uh, the, the first great big man in basketball. Uh, the Lakers weren't in the BAA, so it's just an exhibition game. Featured Goose Tatum and uh, Marquise Haynes, who would play against white players. 
uh, in the Catskills at Cutcher's in the 1950s. And the only reason I bring that up is the uh, one of the floors, one of the parquet floors that uh, was at the Cutcher's uh, Sports Academy was donated by a guy who was a waiter at Cutcher's for a little while, Arnold Arbeck. You know him better as Red Arbeck. And now uh, the Cutcher's Sports uh, Academy is up in uh, Vermont, and they still have the floor. The Lakers had George Mikan. The Globetrotters won the game. Two things came out of the contest. A record crowd to throw the game, and Negro players could play with white players. The BAA had all white players except for a Japanese-American by the name of Wat Misaka. The NBL had some black players in 1942. For those of you who uh, collected uh, LPs, the LP came out in 1948, June 21st. Uh, Columbia Records, a micro group, plastic, double-sided, 12-inch, 33 and a third LP. Comes out in New York. Um, there were 17 minutes of music on each side. The first micro groove LP pressing released. Columbia ML 4001, the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, an E minor performed by soloist Nathan Milstein and Bruno Walter conducting the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. The, Pol the Polaroid Land camera came out that year. A woman the other day when I was doing this said to me, you know, they were really expensive. And I said they were, $89.95, which multiplied by 13 or so about uh, 1300 bucks, which costs, I think, a little less than this today. The Land Camera is a model of film camera uh, manufactured by Polaroid. It went on sale November 26, named after Edward Land, who developed a process for uh, self-developing self photography. Uh, the first commercial model was the uh, 95, model 95, which produced a sepia colored prints in about one minute. You deserve a break today. Well, they weren't uh, doing that in those days, but McDonald's opened in 1948, but not the real McDonald's as you know today. But the McDonald brothers, Richard and Maurice, opened a restaurant in San Bernardino, California on December 12th after they closed their existing restaurant to concentrate on the items that sold the most, hamburgers. The first self-serve McDonald's sold hamburgers, cheeseburgers, french fries, soft drinks, and milkshakes. I feel like I'm on one of those Saturday night skits of the 70s. Hamburgs, hamburger, hamburg, cheeseburger, cheeseburger. And uh, we leave it at that. But let's talk about the legacy from 1948 and how it applies to us today in 2002. Egypt and Israel have a peace treaty. Tensions remain high in the Middle East. Five major wars since 1948. The 48, 56, one, the 48, one, 56, 67, uh, the Six-Day War, 73, the Yom Kippur War in 1982 with Lebanon. North Korea invaded South Korea in 1950. Technically, the United States and South Korea are still at war. So they only signed the truce, a shaky truce, in 1953. Harry Truman bowed out of the 1952 presidential election. His nearly eight years in office was filled with turbulence, the Cold War, Korea. Thurman's presidential bid was the canary in the coal mine, warning of the rebellion of the white voters in the South against the Democratic Party, especially against the civil rights program. It took six years to desegregate, desegregate America's, armed, America's armed forces. 1954, the deactivation of the 94th Engineer Battalion, the Army's last all-black unit, completed the process. On November 15, 1949, the Therum Gutsi and his partner in crime, Narayan Epti, were both hanged at a prison for Gandhi's murder. That is Yalta, 1948. The Soviet Union would fall in 1991, but problems remained between the United States and its successor, Russia. Czechoslovakia was invaded by the USSR in 1968 during the Prague Spring. Czechoslovakia split 1994 into two countries, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Yugoslavia broke up in 1991 and 1992. Apartheid ended in South Africa in 1994. The World Health Organization is still around. Oh, the 1948 legacy, and that uh, kind of looks like 19... No, let's make it 2022, a couple of weeks ago. Bobby Rush. He is the representative from Illinois and a picture of Emmett Till behind them. Because on March 29, 2022, 
the United States President Joe Biden signed into law a signed into law making lynching a federal hate crime. Signed the law to make lynching a federal uh, hate crime. That was more than a hundred years after such legislation was first proposed. House of Representatives approved the bill four twenty two to three on March seventh, twenty twenty two with eight members not voting after it cleared the Senate by unanimous consent. Uh, the three, three Republicans who said no, Thomas Massey of Kentucky, Chip Roy of Texas, Andrew Clyde of Georgia, all voted against the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act of 2022. Oh, that guy, that guy did more than just introduce the Beatles to an American audience. The Texaco Star Theater is largely credited with driving American television sales. The number of TV sets during Burl's run, eight years on TV, was said to have grown from 500,000 when the show first was on the tube to 30 million when the show ended in 1956. Sullivan lasted 23 years. He introduced the Beatles to America and put African Americans on this program when it was unpopular to do so. Oh, um, you deserve a break today over in, in, in Germany, right? In Wismar, Germany, which is where I was when I took that sign. The fall of the Berlin Wall was on November 9th, 1989. Marked the beginning of the end of the Cold War and eventually the Soviet Union. Soviet occupied East Germany, officially known as the German Democratic Republic, was reunited with West Germany on October 3rd, 1990. Many of the Hollywood 10 writers continued to produce screenplays under assumed names using the cinnamon, cinnamon pseudonym. Uh, Robert Richard Dalton Trumbull penned the script for The Brave One, which earned an Academy Award for Best Screenplay in 1957. The blacklisting ended in the 1960s. Gentlemen's Agreement was a groundbreaking film. The Harlem Globetrotters brand has faded. The NBA is worth billions of dollars. Some old rusted uh, gas uh, tanks up in uh, Connecticut. Babe Ruth, still regarded as the greatest player of all time. Technology has come and go, but the long playing record is still in use. The Polaroid Lane camera sold well for years. The McDonald's brothers cut a deal with a Chicago salesman by the name of Ray Kroc. The McDonald's franchise was launched in 1955. I want to thank uh, Ichia and uh, the uh, senior uh, senior center for inviting me. Any questions? Any comments? The floor is all yours. You can unmute yourselves. Do you have anything to say? Nobody has anything to say? Well, if nobody has anything to say, then uh, I'm going to get on out of here. So I want to thank Brenda, Evelyn, Joyce, uh, Lucy, Marilyn, and uh, Stu for uh, spending some time with me uh, this afternoon, as uh, Joe Franklin would say, strolling down memory lane. And uh, we will see you again in July. So. Have a, a great day, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Have a good one. Take care, everybody. Enjoy the day, and if it's uh, raining up in your neck of the woods, uh, stay safe. Bye-bye. My name is Evan Weiner. See you soon. Bye-bye.